Imagine getting a call out of the blue, inviting you to be part of an Olympic team. That's exactly what happened to today's guest, Zachary Penpraise. I'm Roy Ice. Welcome to Lifestyle Magazine. This is Lifestyle Magazine with your host, Roy Ice, and key experts, Mike Tucker, Dr. Sharmini Long, Lionel LaMountain, and Marie Mitchell. We're talking today with a Jewish kid who grew up in Southern California with a passion for playing baseball. Our guest, Zachary Pinpraise, is going to tell us how he went from a construction worker to playing in the Tokyo Olympics. Welcome, Zach. I'm so glad you're here with us today. Thanks for having me, Roy. This is amazing. So, construction worker to Olympics. How in the world did that happen? <laughs> well, it, it you know I was only a construction worker for a little bit. I when growing up, my my dad's my dad owns his own uh, waterproofing business, so he did construction forever and uh, being self-employed. And he always actually his punishment to me if I ever got in trouble was you're coming to work with me on Saturday. <laughs> so uh, that that was kind of a thing that I stayed away from, and I was just like I'm just gonna I'm gonna work my butt off until I can actually play my passion. He's like if you work hard enough. You know, you don't ever have to have a regular job. You can make millions of dollars playing baseball. And I was like, all right. So he was driving me in that way. Yeah. And uh, I only became a construction worker until after I retired when I was 30 years old. So wow. when I That's... retired in 2015, then I started working construction. That's interesting because most parents, if their kid has a dream of playing professional sports, they're like, look, you know, they try to discourage <laughs> them. Chances are you'll know, you know, yeah. many fathers say, look, I've, I've built this up. I'm going to you know, give it to you, but your dad, your dad was the opposite. Yeah, they're giving you the backup plan before, you know, they even let you pursue that, that real passion. And I, I actually got to give him full credit because that's all he did was he just, he said, just, just play until they take your jersey away. That was definitely a motivational thing for me. It's a funny thing now because now I say, you know, don't quit your day job, yeah. but really because like, you know, full time, I want to be a coach, a life coach, a mental performance coach, yeah. but you still got to pay bills. And until you can build something like that, yeah. um, and people tell me that all the time, hey, don't quit your day job. And so yeah. everybody is the same as, you know, and I'm lucky enough to have a dad like that to where he he just continuously pushed my passion of, first of all, playing baseball. And yeah. now he's pushing, you know, for me being a coach now. Talk to me about your experience with the Olympics. I'm a huge fan of the Olympics. In fact, I, my DVR just fills up. Uh, whether it's <laughs> summer or winter Olympics, it's just 80 hours worth of Olympics. I still have, I think, four or five uh, long programs I still have to watch um, from the Olympics because I, I watch it all. Um, did you always want to be in the Olympics? Did you ever think you'd be in the Olympics? I never wanted to be in the Olympics. I really? never thought I would ever be in the Olympics. Growing up, I wanted to play baseball and or soccer. And those weren't technically Olympic sports. I'm not a swimmer, I'm not a sprinter, none of that stuff. So when you think of the Olympics, you don't really think of some of these sports nowadays. I think skateboarding was even one of them. Exactly. I always wanted to play, you know, at the top. And so that kind of counts, I guess. And I never wanted to be an Olympian, but now that I've had a taste, uh, I just told you is that I want to go back. Yeah, it, it got in your blood. Yeah, it definitely gets in your blood. And just being around those kind of people, it, it just changes the way that you that you look. And then when you come back to, say, regular life, yeah, you're just like, oh, man, I was just totally in a different dimension for a yeah. couple of weeks. And so it's really cool. That's what I resonate with the most with the Olympics. It's not the unique sports that you never see any other time of the year or for four years. Um, it is It is the unique individuals that say, I will do everything possible to be the best at this in the world. Yeah. And to break world records of this even. All the time. And when you're walking to the dining hall or you're walking to the gym or even to the rec room at night, like you yeah. see how determined these people are. Mm -hmm. And you can tell when they're like in off mode or on mode. And mm -hmm. when they're walking to their competition, you can tell. Or when they're just going to practice and when they're just going to eat, you yeah. can really tell how, how determined they are and how much of a purpose they have of what, of what they're doing. Absolutely. Now, you played for the uh, the Israel team yeah. in the Olympics. How in the world did that come about? Because you grew up in Southern <laughs> California. Yeah, that's a whole other story. But, uh, you know, uh, po politically or technically, the reason that Israel was created was for uh, Jews that were dispersed in the, in the war to, to technically come home. And it, yeah. it's called making Aliyah. 
And mm -hmm. so if you have any Jewish ties back to your grandparents, it used to just be on your mother's side. Now they change it to your, your mother or your father's side. Mm -hmm. You can make what's called Aliyah and you can go to Israel and become a citizen. And when I first got into professional baseball, the Jewish community, they just pile stuff on you. They're like, they send you letters and you're getting stuff and you're getting all these letters in your locker and you're like, what are these? And it's like, I'm a big Jewish baseball fan. I, I only collect Jewish baseball players memorabilia. Cool. And so you become part of this community. Yeah. And then it just kind of took off from there. And then down the road, they needed some guys to play uh, in the qualifier. And that's kind of how we're here. Oh, my word. So you you played, I understand it. They kind of have a World Cup type, uh, a World Cup competitions that lead up yeah. to that. Yeah, so there's ultimately a World Baseball Classic, which is separate, and that happens uh, normally in January. That's where like the big leaguers play because they're not in season. And so that's like a big time thing. But for the Olympics is during the summer and the big leaguers, they can't get out of their contracts. Teams don't want to let them go. Right. So, but every two years, Israel plays in what's called the, the European Championship. So yeah. if you come in the top five in the European Championships, you go to the, um, the Olympic qualifier, which was in Italy, and Parma and Bologna, amazing experience. And um, t then you have to win that tournament. So we beat top teams like Italy, yeah. Netherlands, Czech Republic, um, South Africa, yeah. and Spain um, in order to qualify for the Olympics. And made it all the way. And you, and you guys actually did, uh, actually you did really well there. Yeah, we made I got some magic. <laughs> you did, you made some magic happen. We're gonna talk more with you in a moment, but we gotta take a break. And when we come back, we're gonna find out how Zachary's life was changed when he tried to do the right thing, but ended up being bullied. We'll see you in a moment. Welcome back. We're talking with Olympic athlete Zachary Penpraise. And joining us in this conversation is our Attitude Key Specialist, Lionel Mark LaMountain. Zach, um, I want you to share with me, I understand there was a time when you tried to come to a girl's rescue, but it didn't turn out the way that you thought it would. Yeah, I, I wouldn't technically say I came to a rescue, but, you know, we were in middle school and there was a, there was a time when one of my friends who was dating this girl and we were in class and she had mentioned like, you know, he's, he's being mean to me. That's not the word that she used, but you know, he's being mean. And, and I was like, okay, well, you want me to talk to him? And she was just like, ah, I don't know, like maybe. And I, in hindsight, obviously, I, I don't think she really wanted me to, but I had mentioned it to him and said, look, man, he, she thinks that, you know, you're being mean to her. And he came at me and was instantly replied with like, no, you just like her and you want us to break up. And I was like, no, actually I don't. I just like, you know, she's yeah. Yeah. telling you that, she's being, that you're being mean to her. And that was kind of the end of the conversation. But then later on, I started getting threats from his friend, um, basically his, his hired mafia, I guess you could say at that, 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 you know, 12 years old. Junior high mafia. Yeah, so he was like this tiny guy and this other guy was one of the bigger guys. And so uh that was back in the internet when they had like you know i don't even know what they called it it was like a, a you could look up how to make bombs and stuff like that oh. it was like one of the first things on the internet where like you could look these things up and he started making threats on aol it's aol aol into messenger which um nobody really knows about anymore yeah. but he started making threats and zach will die and all this oh. stuff and came to me in, in class and um, so my parents went to the principal's office and said, look, this has got to take care of, like, he's making threats. And, yeah. and so, um, the, the teachers and everybody's like, what are you doing? Like, well, you don't need to do this. Isn't that serious? And ended up the cops being, ended up cops came in, he got a misdemeanor at 12 years old. Wow. And so all this stuff, and everybody thought I was the bad guy because I got this 12 year old, a misdemeanor, all this stuff. His dad was actually in agreement that like, he, this needs to be taken care of. And, um, you know, like a month, like a month later, Columbine happened. Mm -hmm. And so it was almost like a moment when I was like, see, like, this is real. Like these threats are real. It happened. But when that happened, I felt like the whole world was coming down on me. Uh, my friends kind of were like, what were you doing? There's a few friends that stuck by my side, but there was teachers, principals, everybody was like, you're the bad guy. And so I started wearing a hood. Uh, I started smoking cigarettes. I started hanging out in the corner. I, I distanced myself from everything. And so that's, that was when the trauma first hit me as a 12 year old and it totally changed my character. You, you said trauma, which is a very important word. And when you hear your story, that whole thing, it's obviously a defining moment that you, <laughs> you started going and looking for something. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna say the phrase, but you became 
the bully of bullies. Yeah, Can you yeah. Explain what were you doing? Yeah, so definitely I started picking on, and and the the guy I was friends with was one of the popular guys, and so I started distancing myself from the popular crowd, and um, I started going out of my way to pick on the popular kids because I felt like they were they had this elite mentality where they they could talk down to people and uh, we're over here in the center of the quad, look at us and you know, you peons over there. And it started at a young age, you know, we still see it now in, in the world world, but yeah. it was such a moment where like, I would actually go out of my way and to pick on these people. Mm. Um, and it's funny enough because some of them were my friends, but, and some of those that were my friends, they kind of laughed it off, but I would really go out of my way to put signs up in the lockers or whatever it was to make these people feel like they weren't all that. And so I would really aggressively go out of my way. I would wake up early. I would get to school early and put signs up. And wow. it was really an aggressive thing. And it turned into a, it, 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 it turned me into this guy where I was looking for things because I thought the world was after me. Were they after you? I don't think so. No. I mean, I don't think, I don't think the but world was after me. Because you believed that they were, you were acting I did that way. because of my trauma. Like I was traumatized to think that the whole world was against me and it really wasn't. So I felt like I had to be against the world. Um, it is amazing, especially during those years, the developmental years, how such little things, small things can completely change yeah. your, your just view of who you are as an individual throughout, throughout your life. Like that was an event, but what life change did you experience beyond that? So playing professional baseball and doing all that stuff. And I, I would take the same kind of attitude. And the reason I, I didn't really make it in baseball was because of my mindset of like everything was against me. So wow. any coach that came to me to tell me something, it was like, no, 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 like I was pushing them away. I was really aggressive. And my dad would say, listen to them, just say, okay, try try things out, do all this stuff. And be like, no, 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 like they're not for me. Like they're just trying to do their own career. And I was really like mentally wasn't there. Mm. I was mentally against the world. And mm. um, wow. I remember a coach telling me like, you think you know everything. And I said, no, I just, you're just not giving me credit for what I do know. Hmm. And I realized like, oh, I just want a little bit of credit. And so after I retired, after I kind of was out of baseball, um, I was getting married and I was hiring a band and I was hiring one of my childhood friends who he's a, he's a, the band leader at a church and he's, he's got a great band and they play, they play all over, all over the California and they play weddings. And I was like, dude, I want you to play at my wedding. I know you're a cover band, and he was like, all right, this is how much it is. And my parents were like, are you sure? And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> and they're like, you don't remember? And I was like, no, what are you talking about? <laughs> and they're like, I don't know if we should tell you. I was like, yes, you should tell me. <laughs> and they told me that he, the, the lead singer of the band who I was dealing with, he was the one who made the threats. Oh, he was wow. the one making the bombs. He was the one saying, I will die. Mm. And um, it, I remember at the dinner table, I was sitting there, and everything started coming out. Like, mm. oh, like... That's what, oh, I, I didn't remember any of it yeah. until they told me and I started releasing all these blocks and I started, yeah. I had a breakdown for years. I mean, it was like, it was like a year thing where I worked with spiritual healers. Mm -hmm. I was working with mental performance coaches. I was doing everything I could to release all these things. And that's kind of when I started getting connected back to myself. That's awesome. I want to talk with you more and I want to spend a lot more time unpacking this <laughs> yes. in the next segment, but we got to take a break. So don't go away. When we come back, we're going to learn how Zachary took his love of baseball and turned it into an opportunity to help others think better. A study reveals that cities that have a major league baseball team actually have lower divorce rates than cities without the team. Go figure. Baseball's slower pace allows for conversation and interaction in between pitches and plays. Truthfully, every relationship benefits from time, a slower pace, the opportunity for conversation, for give and take. So, if you want to help your marriage, become a baseball fan. Welcome back. We're going to find out how Zachary turned his life experiences and his love of baseball into a method to help people find a way to improve their thinking. So we just went through some of the experiences that you had in life, but now you're shifting into uh, actually helping people deal with things like that and, and even greater as a life coach. So yeah, definitely. How, how did that come to be? Um, well, when I was playing 
baseball, I, I had a mental performance coach myself. My second year in professional baseball, my first year was really bad. I ended up going like finishing the season like one for 52. I was wow. I made the all-star team and all this stuff. And after the all-star break, they started tweaking everything and I totally mentally shut down. So I started working with a mental performance coach and I used all those tools to play 10 years professionally. And uh, I realized after playing baseball, I wanted to help athletes. And I started realizing in these physical lessons that, you know, these kids are just struggling mentally. And then I started helping, you know, my friends around me and I started living into this stuff. And like I said before, is I, I went through this spiritual healing basically where I was working with all these coaches and stuff like that. And I went to a, um, a program called Optimal Being. And after I became a certified uh, mental performance coach, I went through this program called Optimal Being and they introduced me to journaling exercises, breathing exercises, and all sorts of stuff like that. And I started using these things called mind shifters because I'm a big journaler. Yeah. So um, first of all, with the breathing, um, breathing, I think everybody needs to learn some breathing exercises. Just taking a deep breath mm. and releasing that feels great right now. Yeah. Um, my favorite breath is box breath. What's box breathing? Box breath is basically you breathe in a box. So you five second inhale, five second hold, five second exhale, and then five second hold out. The holds are very important because- How, how long do you do that for, by the way? You can do it for anywhere. I, I only do two rounds of it to two start rounds. my morning. That's okay. 40 seconds right. of breathing, which can change okay. your whole life. Interesting. But they've they've shown, like they've done studies that say like anywhere from four to five minutes of that okay. can really change the way that you can handle right. your, your emotions throughout the day. I interrupted you. You said the, the holding is very important. The holding is very important because um, our brain lies to us. It, we have so many thoughts and our brain is constantly lying to us. We have really? like 60,000 thoughts a day and most of them are lies. Most of them aren't even our thoughts, right? Wow. And so, um, like for my experience, my brain was telling me that the world was against me all the time when really the world was for me. So the holds are very important, especially the hold out because a lot of us can hold in um, because we have oxygen in us, but when we, have when we don't have any oxygen in us and we're holding out, our brain from the very get-go is saying, you gotta breathe or you're gonna die. You gotta breathe or you're gonna die. And it'll lie to you in a matter of holding your breath for 10 seconds, it'll lie to you a hundred times. And you're like, wait, I haven't I haven't died yet. So what else are you lying to me about? So it's a way to challenge the brain. The Definitely, thought. you're constantly challenging your brain with a simple box breath. Do you do anything else while you're doing the box breathing? You just do the box breathing. Just like box it's, breathing. So it's, it's, when you're in, inhale for five seconds, hold for five seconds, exhale for five yeah. seconds. When you're holding out, your brain is lying to you in those five seconds. Now. At the end of my box breath, I hold for as long as I can. Oh, yeah? Like uh, my body will be twitching and my, you can just see like <laughs> I'm panicking and my blue. brain is panicking. But honestly, I, I encourage people to pass out. I'm like, pass out, pass out. <laughs> because if you pass out, you're gonna, your, your body's gonna breathe and you're gonna wake up. Like it's, it's naturally, there's no way you're just gonna pass out and die because you didn't take a breath. You're gonna pass out, your body's gonna take a breath and you're gonna wake up eventually. Right? Nobody's ever died from doing box breath. Okay. I don't think so. We're not like, suggesting people pass out either, are we? <laughs> okay. I'm just saying. I've never seen anybody okay. pass out because your your body panics and you take a breath. But you understand how much your your brain is lying to you. So I, I learn about about breathing techniques, not just box breath, but that's my favorite one. So you use this to deal with trauma, anxiety. So it's like the physiological change that takes place with the box breathing just tranquilizes you and calms you down. Uh, maybe put some space between you and the emotion, giving you some objectivity. Yeah. But what you said, and I've never done before because we're talking off camera, you're talking about how you, you've added journaling into the box breathing? Do, yeah. You do um, that for yourself? How there's do, separate how that exercises, work? but um, I've been journaling for my whole life. My mom always kept a journal of day-to-day, -day, not day-to-day, -day, but she would, different experiences throughout my life. And I remember pulling out this journal and be like, what is this, mom? And, she say, "Oh, this is what you did," and blah blah. So I've been journaling my whole life. When I got to professional baseball, I would take notes of what pitchers were throwing me or what I did experience that day, and I would take notes on like what I did well, what I need to improve on. You ever journal about the kid that showed up at the wedding to that you bullied? <laughs> no, I mean I that, that wrote, actually threatened you. I wrote him a forgiveness letter. You so did? I, I also write letters and oh, wow. I'll burn them or I'll what throw them away. I won't send them to them. Like, it's getting it off my body. It's but did you ever have the conversation with him? I did. I actually ended How up having a conversation go? with him. Uh, he, I was like, do you remember this? He's like, yeah, for sure. I had a misdemeanor, all this stuff. And I was okay. like, wow. any hard feelings? He's like, nah, man, it actually changed my life. Like, oh, really? Yeah, so he ended up turning like Christian and right. becoming like a head of mu music at, at a Christian church. And he, okay. very religious, and he opened up a music school in Moorpark and so, changed his life. Facing that situation, it takes courage. 
for both of you. I mean, that helped, did that help deal with trauma and anxiety? 100%, anyway? 100%. Okay. I mean, after that meeting, we sat down for coffee. And like after that, it was, we didn't really have any hard feelings to begin with because it was after he played at my wedding. So it was like a couple years after. I was like, hey, man, I got to talk to you about this. And, yeah. and then there was no hard feelings, nothing. But it, I still felt a sense of energy getting off of me. You had release there. I we did. only have one minute oh, of, left of the show. Yeah. But I want to ask you, you, you work with a lot of people, helping them with life coaching. What's some of the common things that's been the most helpful? I would say my number one thing is visualization. Mm -hmm. um, seeing and feeling and being exactly what you want to be and where you want to be. It's, it's, it's about the feeling. It's not about wanting something, but when you, when I pictured myself as a young kid playing in Dodger Stadium and looking over and be detailed, like I saw my dad and my mom and my brother in the stands and the, you are in such a moment that creates such a feeling. So visualization is my number one thing, breathing, and then the mind shifting exercise. Um, and, and that's just journaling. But yeah. mind shifting helps people that can't just sit down and write. Mm -hmm. It's a trigger. It, it's a sentence. You know, I, ex I acknowledge, I accept, and I allow this experience to be a part of my life. And then you just breathe and you just write and you go. So visualization, breathing, and journaling is kind of like my main things um, and just living and walking the walk and being in the moment. Yeah. Wow, that, that sounds like it definitely could have life-changing effects on people. Thank you so much for sharing with us yeah. today. We're, we're delighted to be able to spend some time with you. Don't go away because right after this, I have some final thoughts. It is natural for your subconscious mind and your ego to sabotage your positive growth. If you're struggling with negative thoughts about yourself and the people around you, your attitude will not simply change because you want it to. Connect with activities like journaling and prayer to help you release the negative things of your past and then watch your positive attitude soar. For more meaningful life tips and an opportunity to view this show and all other episodes, visit our website at lifestyle.org. Thanks for watching, and we look forward to continuing this journey with you on future episodes of Lifestyle Magazine.